Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for such a nice introduction. Uh, and it's actually a pleasure to be talking today about a topic that is very close to me, both personally and professionally, which is climate change. And I'll probably try and talk about it from a very, very, very nerd point of view. If the glasses have not given it away by now, I don't know what will. I am a nerd. So let's start with that. So let, let me ask a question. How many of you remember the first thing you did when you woke up this morning? I know what I did. I checked my mobile phone. Actually, I have a confession to make. I check it even before I brush my teeth. Uh, let me be honest, I actually do it while brushing my teeth sometimes if I'm running late. Even if you did not check it the first thing in the morning, I'm sure you use it to navigate to work, or to food, or just check news. Even the pandemic was a little more bearable for all of us because we were able to connect with our loved ones. And of course, the hilarious social media videos are always a plus. Technology is highly integrated into our lives, right? And according to a research, there are about 50.1 billion electronic devices that are connected and are online at the moment. That is more than seven times the number of human beings on this planet. And out of those 50.1 billion, 3.5 billion are smartphones, just in 2020. And that number will go up by another 300 million next year. Now, that's a lot of mobile phones. As I was coming in to get mic'd up and start with my talk, I actually counted the number of electronic devices the tech support team had. I counted 21. And that is just the devices they have now. How many of these devices they would have had in the last 10 years? How many of these devices all of us would have had in the last 10 years? Just extrapolate that number globally now. Right? And that is electronic technology. It's surrounding us. We use it for everything, from doing simple things like taking photographs to analyzing complex data at work. We use it for literally everything. What has led to this? And I started asking, like, why this has happened? Why do we feel the need to keep upgrading our technology very quickly, and in some cases, even every year? The answer is here. Sorry for the very technical graph, but what it shows is the increasing processing power of our electronic devices these days that we have. The most high-tech processors in your electronic devices today can actually do 10 trillion calculations per second. And that number was only at a million 50 years ago. We have doubled our processing capabilities every year. And that has allowed us to do amazing things. Stream high-quality videos, take even better pictures, analyze all the data that is coming from satellites. We have been able to do that. But look at this picture a bit more closely. In 2020, it actually tells a different story. We are at the cusp of the next technological evolution in the electronic industry. Self-driving cars are almost here. Humans are trying to go to Mars. Medical practitioners are trying to have better technology to detect diseases. The current computing technology is saturated and will not be able to support that. What would be the next quantum leap in technology? Will it be DNA computing? Quantum computing? Or finally, will we have singularity where the robots take over the world and we don't know what to do with it? But before I try and answer that question tonight, let's just park that problem for a second. Let's just take a step back. Let's just have a think about all the steps we have taken to be where we are today. Let's just think of all the devices we have already made. How many of you know where your old phones are? Lying in a closet somewhere? I have a bottom drawer. Everybody has a bottom drawer where all the old mobile phones go. Right? Have you ever thought, what happens to all your discarded electronic devices when they're outdated and old? They all end up here. And then, here. Electronic waste. According to some research, the second most dangerous waste in the world after nuclear waste, and we have no idea how to get rid of it. Let's just put some numbers on it. Just in 2019, all of us collectively around the globe produced about 55 million tons of electronic waste. Increased urbanization, increased spending capabilities, shorter lifespan of electronic devices just to make them cheap, have all been contributing to massive amounts of electronic waste that we produce around the globe. That number will go up to 75 million just in the next decade. And what's baffling is only 8% of that is recycled. The rest of the amount is unaccounted for, 
or goes into landfill. Now, let me just put a context to that number. I really like this picture. Just in 2016, we produced about 45 million tons of electronic waste. That is 4,500 Eiffel Towers made out of electronic waste that was just produced that year. Now, that means every country on this planet can have 20 of these Eiffel Towers. I'm not sure if they will look as pretty as the actual one in Paris, but each country can have 21 of those. Some of it is recycled. But recycling requires even more energy. We have to invest energy to recycle some of the products that are already in there. So putting them into landfill is no option. In fact, some of the states and territories in Australia have actually had legislations where you cannot dump electronic waste into landfill. Why? Because of harmful materials like cadmium, arsenic, lead, mercury, silicons, and other plastics, which go into the soil and then into our waterways and come back to us as food and cause chronic diseases of the mind, heart, and central nervous system, and so on and so forth. So dumping electronic waste is not an option for us anymore. So now, we have a two-faced problem. How do we go to the next evolution of technology, but at the same time, how do we do it without generating all the waste we have so far? And that's a problem that inspired me to undertake the research I do. In my early years of studying nanomaterial science and quantum physics, I was inspired by a lot of scientists who were very, very inspiring to promote sustainable research, a technology that supports the next leap of human evolution, but at the same time is not harming the environment. That's where my team and I, we turned towards nature for inspiration. We started looking at naturally occurring materials that would probably serve as semiconductors and we can make our electronic devices out of those so that they might not harm the environment. And that's where we came across the concept of organic semiconductors. We started developing a new class of organic semiconductors made from just naturally occurring carbon and hydrogen. These materials can be recycled several times and are naturally biodegradable and can replace all of the electronic devices in this room. The way we grow them is a very interesting concept, which I'm going to talk about. But I want you to have a look at the molecular structure of the material called pentacene on the screen to your left. We were able to grow these materials after several years of optimizations, doing several permutations and combinations where we came across this material, which we were able to grow with a precise thickness of one carbon atom. And that was one of the things that we were actually working hard for the last five years to achieve. We started growing them by a process called chemical vapor deposition, which is physically stacking one atom over the other, one molecule over the other in a controlled environment in a furnace, just like 3D printing. But we did it with atoms. And this gives them the flexibility to be bent into any shape like this. And this was one of the very interesting properties we started discovering with these materials. Because they're so thin, they can be bent into any shape, like a flexible piece of paper that you might have. The thickness of these materials, as you saw, is actually only three nanometers. That is 100 times thinner than a single strand of human hair. As strong as steel, and they can hold about a million circuits in the size of your fingernail. While we were growing and optimizing these semiconductors, we actually came across a very interesting property. Because I still haven't answered the question, whether this will be the next technological leap, I can't claim so at all. I don't think it would be. I have a lot of things to do. But we have a lab-scale prototype. This is an actual image from my lab, where these organic semiconductors have been made into a lab-scale prototype or a transistor, which is the processing unit in any of the electronic devices that we use today. It's too hard to be seen. You would need a microscope to see it. Uh, we used a pretty good camera to get the image but you would need a microscope to see what an actual semiconductor looks like because it's only one carbon atom thick. But this does not answer the question I started my talk with earlier in the evening. Will this be the next leap which takes us to the next generation of computing? And in order to find this answer, we were doing a lot of experiments. We were trying to discover the properties of these materials, see if they have something interesting, because they had the biodegradable aspect to them. And that's where we came across this. These materials actually have an amazing property. They can convert electricity into light and light into electricity in about one trillionth of a second. 
That's how fast they can convert light into electricity. And this opened a whole new plethora of opportunities and avenues for start using these materials in a lot of interesting things. We have already started prototyping and building LEDs, which would for serve as flexible displays, foldable e-papers, or even solar cells that can be integrated onto your clothes or onto your backpack, and that can start to charge your devices. The flexibility of these materials gives us an opportunity to start developing electronic devices that have the capability to do what we need them to do. But are they powerful enough? Think back about it. Why do we call the devices we use today electronics? We call them electronics because they run on electricity to process information and carry data. These materials, on the other hand, they use light or photons. And light travels much faster than electricity making the performance of these devices a thousand times faster than the best computers we have out today. And that's why the devices that would be made out of these materials will actually not be called electronic devices. They would be called photonic devices. This is just a figurative representation of what a photonic circuit looks like, where we can control the photons or the light as they move across the material and have memory, work as transistors, do the processing for us, and everything around an electronic device. And this was particularly interesting for mobile phones, because that's something I'm very passionate about as well. Because do you remember the time when you had your first mobile phone? I remember it was probably 12 years ago when my parents actually allowed me to have one. I've bought eight since then. Not to mention three computers, two laptops, a tablet, a smartphone, and a Kindle, if you count that as an electronic device. So lots of electronic devices. So we thought this material can emit light, and this material can emit as a processing unit. And that's what your phone is. Your phone is a screen, which is emitting light, and a processing chip sitting behind. This material can act as both. And that's where we have the opportunity to develop fully flexible, organic mobile phones that would be completely biodegradable. Now imagine having a mobile phone like this wrapped around your wrist in a few years, made from completely organic semiconductors. Can do processing as quick as a supercomputer. You can literally be carrying a supercomputer folded like a pocket square with you at all times. And when this one gets outdated, you can throw it away with your garden waste or use it for fertilizer. And more importantly, you will never have to worry about a cracked screen on your mobile phone. Mobile phones and electronic devices made from these organic semiconductors are one of the ways, are one of the few attempts that we are trying to achieve the next level of technological evolution so that it can keep supporting our human lives as we know it, but at the same time does not harm the environment. This is my attempt. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.